on cornerofthegalaxy.com. Welcome to Corner of the Galaxy, the show that talks 100% L.A. Galaxy soccer. We're glad you could join us. Now it's time to sit back and relax as your hosts navigate through the twisting, turning, but never boring world of the five-time MLS Cup champion, L.A. Galaxy. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Corner of the Galaxy on cornerofthegalaxy.com. I'm your host, Josh Guessman, coming to you from, well, not Corner of the Galaxy Studios. We're here on location at Dignity Health Sports Park. In an event suite, overlooking the field, everything looks wonderful, beautiful, and if you're keeping track, we're on a Friday. We're basically Friday, just before the game against the Portland Timbers, although this will probably come out after that. So, keep that in mind as we're going. We have a really fun show for you today. Uh, Going to be joined by LA Galaxy midfielder, Mr. Sasha Kleschen, so we're excited about that. So, without much further ado, let's jump right into it. Sasha, thanks for stopping by. Certainly appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. Yeah, I, I know we've sort of been working this out the last couple of weeks, so I'm glad we could find a little bit of time. I want to uh, start by asking how you're feeling, because Greg was talking about the hip flexor <coughs> issue, and we know that you've had uh, ha- had a little injury uh, for, for a little while, so h- how's that going for you? I'm starting to feel really good. Um, I'm really tired today. It's been a hard four days of uh, trying to get my fitness back, but I am feeling really good. Uh, I'm hoping to take part in a training session on Sunday for the first time. Uh, and optimistically hopeful to be ready for the game next weekend against San Jose. But I got to say, you have to work way harder when you're injured, and it sucks, and I hate it. So this has been the longest injury of my career. I was going to ask. I know you haven't been injured all that much. It's been a few. It's been four weeks and two days now, which has been the longest by about nine days. Uh, I, I was out for three weeks at one point, you know, 10 years ago. So this has been uh, tough on me physically and mentally, but I'm excited to be back and hopefully training soon. I, I was going to ask you a little bit of how the mental toll takes on you. I, it, we've talked a bunch, and, and over the years you've been with the Galaxy, certainly you've always talked about how your availability is sort of is a skill, right? Is something that you, you pride yourself on. So this, this has to be killing you. I hate it, man. I hate <laughs> it so much. It's, uh, I told Greg yesterday, because I, I, I got put through the ringer out on the field uh, fitness-wise with the running and you know, trying to get the power back in my legs. And as I was walking off the field, you could see that I was dead. And I was like, I hate this part of the job. And he was like, yeah, don't I know it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it's been rough. I, I think I've probably not been the best guy to be around for the past few <laughs> weeks. I think this has been a learning experience for me, even though it's late in my career. Uh, just as to try to keep the mentality right, try right. to stay positive, try to still be a, a good guy to be around in the locker room, try to still be helpful for the guys even while I'm not on the field. Yeah, I, I have to imagine that's a, that, that's a difficult. Speaking of le- later in the career, you find you're still uh, learning things every single day and that's probably hasn't stopped your entire career? I mean, I hope that doesn't stop for my entire life. I think that's been, uh, you know, I read a lot um, on all different topics. And that's one thing that I hopeful uh, that I hopefully never lose right. is the ability to just try to keep learning throughout my life, and uh, hopefully my kids pick that up too. Well, and and you're a Southern California native too. We should point that out, um, just because I, I think that's you grew up at a really interesting time. I think in Southern California, just in terms of soccer and where it was going. But um, Huntington Beach uh, originally. So um, so I, I mean, do you think back to that time? And it, it feels like, at least from my perspective, because we're pretty. We're, we're close in age. You're a little bit younger than me. But I remember soccer starting to really gain this foothold and this, this attention, especially in Southern California. And do you find that maybe that was a special time or do you think it's continued to, to, to develop? Well, I think it's definitely more special now because of academies. Right. 
Um, but I do think it was a good time back when I was growing up too, because ODP was kind of the big benchmark and there were just tons of good players. I think, you know, we, we see, you know, throughout MLS and the history of MLS, how many professional players have come from Southern California that the talent here is just very, very rich. And so, uh, that was good for me because I was not the best growing up and I got challenged to play against a lot of very good players growing up that, you know, eventually became pros or played at good colleges and, and, you know, I just kind of stuck it out and stuck it out. Uh, it would it would have been very interesting to see where I would have fit in today right. with the Academy and stuff like that, had I been good enough to play for the LA Galaxy Academy or not, and if that would have helped me if I would have become professional earlier than I did. I don't know. But, um, yeah, Southern California is an amazing place for soccer because we can play year-round and, and there's so much talent here. Yeah, you say, you know, how you would fit into that that system. Do you feel like it's more siloed now where it's it's more chopped up or is there more opportunity now i think there's probably more opportunity now you have lafc here with an academy too you also have all these other local clubs that kind of have their academy teams that get to play against the la galaxy academy and lafc so you're it's more competitive it also just depends on who's in charge of these clubs and what type of profile of player they're looking for and things like that so I don't know where I would have fit in because I was a scrawny little kid who had really good technique and I wasn't very fast. And uh, but I definitely had something special about me to play soccer. It just uh, there were different coaches that said I was too small and too slow, and then there were other coaches that said I was fantastic. So it just depends on uh, whose eyes are looking at you, I guess. And somebody's always watching. I, I always think, and talking to a bunch of soccer players over the years, I, I always think there was this predisposition for you to be a soccer player, right? I mean, there's something in you that maybe just work that way. And so there was something special in that, but there's also a ton of hard work. There's lots of people who have special things, but then there's the, I think you said the stick to itness, right? Yeah. Just keep going. What, what, what was it for you that, that you think got you to where you are now? Yeah, there's a big combination of all of what you spoke of. Um, the thing for me was that I didn't see any other option. Like I, I felt like from the time I watched the 94 World Cup on, I must have been nine or 10. I told everybody I ever met in my life that I would be a professional soccer player one day. And it just is like, uh, I don't know if I'm, I believe that I was put on this earth to do something, but in my opinion and in my mind, all I ever thought of was soccer. And so that was like, uh, it came to a point where I kind of, I was 16, 17 and, and Steve Sampson was the coach of my ODP team. Okay. After having just coached in the world cup in 2002, a few years earlier. Right. Uh, or was he in 98? Um, I think it was, I don't, I don't remember if he coached in 98 or 98, 98. Okay. And, uh, he caught me from the state team and I was like, uh, I was at this point where I didn't know if soccer was going to continue or not. Right. And, and my dad just told me, don't let one guy's opinion change what you think about yourself. Like if you think soccer is your thing, then you're going to keep going. Right. And so I kept going, I kept going. And then like two months later, before like the regional tournament with the state team, Steve Sampson had some problem with his stomach right. and couldn't go to the tournament. Right. So whoever the coach was that took over, he brought me back right away. And I played every minute and I played great. And then I went to college and then it kind of just kept going after that. So I kind of got a lucky break there, I guess, but I also just knew that this was it for me and, and I was going to keep going. So uh, ever since then, it's been like every single day of training, how can I get better? How can I get better? How can I be the best in the world? You know, I never reached the best in the world, but I did pretty good. Yeah, but I mean, there's also the the luck elements involved, and I think whenever we're we're talking about you know all these these rises to some of the best athletes in the world, and and you can say, hey, you never made it to the, you're one of the best athletes in the world compared to everybody else in the large <laughs> scheme of things, you were in the top one percent of of what you do. So don't ever think that that's you know I can't do what you do. Um, so so there's something that, but there is a luck element to this, and there is a being in the right place at the right time. Now. I'm a big believer that if you work hard enough, you know, you can make that luck favors you whenever it happens. But I mean, is there some acknowledgement, at least from, from you or from, from other guys, in that, that you guys are lucky to, to sort of be where you're at? Yeah, I, I agree with you that there is um, luck involved in sometimes you just have to be in the right place at the right time. And like I said, there's always eyes on you and it just depends on whose eyes are on you at the right moment. Right. Um, but yes, you can keep putting yourself into good positions and good positions that sooner or later, somebody important is going to notice you. And that moment for me happened, uh, also with that state ODP team 
there was a game in Chula Vista. There, there was a tournament in Chula Vista for the 1984 regional teams. Okay. And I'm 1985. Okay. And so the 1984 regional team was down in Chula Vista, all four regional teams. And Manfred Schellscheidt, who's the coach of Seton Hall University, was coaching the Region 1, which is the East Region regional team. And before their tournament started, he wanted to play a friendly game. So he called our state team... 85s to play a regional game a friendly game against them down in chula vista and so i remember driving down there early one morning um playing the game you know had a good game after the game he came up to me right away and just said like um you know i, I was told you don't this was this was january of my senior year of high school okay. so everybody else on the state team was going to notre dame ucla committed everything i right. was the only one who didn't have a college yet okay and he was like do you do you want to come visit seton hall it's in new jersey and i said no i'm not interested thanks like i'm California. Right, right. Can't, can't do that East Coast yeah, thing, right? Sorry, not, yeah. not interested. And he said, okay, I think you're fantastic. I love the way you play, you know, blah, blah, blah. And he called me again about a month later. So then it was kind of mid to late February and was like, do you have a school yet? Or do you want to come for a visit? And I said, okay, uh, screw it. Let's go for a visit. Right. And so I went for a visit and I loved it and I had the best time. And I remember before I even left the campus on the second day, I told him I was coming. <laughs> and so that, that for me is kind of like my lucky moment where he saw me, he, he was the one, cause I, I mean, I was a senior in high school and I had an offer from Cal state Fullerton where they told me I probably wouldn't play my freshman year cause I was too small. Right. And an offer from Cal state Northridge, which, you know, it seemed okay also. Right. And, you know, he brought me to Seton Hall and kind of the rest is history after that. So that was pretty, my, my fortunate moment. And I've always been thankful for him and everything he's done for my career. Yeah. And if you look at your time at Seton Hall, you're very successful in, in what you did there. Um, and then ultimately leads to you coming into to Major League Soccer. I want to talk about that in a second. But you did mention the World Cup in 94. And being we just had the announcement of Los Angeles being a host city for 2026, um, just the World Cup coming back. Um, I was, you know, I, I, we're, like I said, we're pretty close in this. I'm 40, so we're, we're pretty close in the same age. Uh, you're younger than me. I want to point that out. I don't, I don't want you to get angry with me. Um, but I, I remember that World Cup, and it had an impression on me, but I was a baseball player growing up. So this was, it was like, oh, that's cool. And, you know, hold on. My dad went to a the 94 World Cup final okay. um, without me, by the way, I would like to point <laughs> out. I'm not bitter about that at all, though. Um, so, um, so I have that. What, what did that do for you, um, just in terms of, of seeing the World Cup here in the United States, the highest attended World Cup, by the way, uh, in the United States? Yeah, so I think leading up to that, I had been to one USA-Mexico game at the Rose Bowl in 93. Okay. Um, and that seemed like a big deal. And I was like, man, like these guys, this is all they do. Like they just play soccer and in front of like all these people. But the Rose Bowl wasn't full, I don't think. And then as the world cup came the next year and I saw like the Rose bowl with a hundred thousand people for the final, I was just like blown away that that many people cared about soccer and that like, this could be like a real life. And right. like, these guys were like idols to me. And then I just watched soccer on TV every weekend after that. And that, that just seeing how many, how, how many people cared about the world cup and what that meant to like the players and to the fans and to people from countries all over the world that came here. It was like, it was like a whole other world opened up for me. Yeah, it, did you, were you aware of the formation of Major League Soccer at that time? I was not. No. And I, I, I was completely. I had no idea Major League Soccer really existed for probably a good five or six years after the league. But did you see that as maybe a possible pathway at that time? You you didn't. No, but then then when the league started in '96, you know, my dad would take us to Galaxy games, so we would go to the Rose Bowl, and then. You know, then I started following the league like crazy. Right. Like I was watching, you know, I loved Valderrama and Marco Echeverri and Precky and like these guys were like amazing. And I, I watched so much MLS. And then I think probably around the time, maybe when I was like 15 or 16, and then I started to see other like 16, 17, 18 year olds turn pro. Right. I was like, okay, this is it for me. Like I, I, I want to play in MLS so bad one day. And then when this stadium opened, I think it was, I don't remember what year, 02 or 03. Yeah, 02, 03. And I remember coming and sitting in that corner over there and watching uh, Galaxy against San Jose Earthquakes and Arturo Alvarez was playing uh -huh. for San Jose, who was the same age as me. And I was just like, okay, I got to get here soon. Like this is like starting. clock's ticking, <laughs> Yeah, right? clock's ticking. And so that, yeah, that, that was it for me. Yeah. So then you go off to college, right? Um, as I said, very successful time at, at Seton Hall. Um, I think three NCAA appearances. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. Um, a whole bunch of other awards as well. If I, I could go down the list. Um, but you then get um, into the league with Chivas USA. Yeah. 
I, uh, you know, interesting story because I did some broadcasting a few days ago with Alexi Lawless. Right. Who was the GM of the New York, New Jersey Metro Stars at the time. Okay. And so going back a few months during my junior year of college, I had trained with the Metro Stars because it was, you know, 15 minutes away from Seton Hall and Bob Bradley had happened to be the coach. Right. And he was friends with Manny Shellshite. So they kind of set it up that I could come train with the Metro Stars to kind of see how I fit in. And then when the draft came around, Bob had just been fired by Metro Stars and hired by Chivas. Okay. So Bob knew me. And I desperately wanted to stay in New York, New Jersey and play for the Metro Stars. Right. That was like, I had been watching them all through college the last few years. And, you know, my brother was still at Seton Hall. All my friends were still there. I could stay living like where I was living. It was ideal. So I met with Alexi Lawless before the draft right. before the combine right before the combine started and he had the number five pick and he pretty much convinced me not to play in the combine i had a slight knee injury but i could have played right but he's like if you play in the combine and you do really well you could get picked in the top four if if you don't play i think we can get you at number five and right. i was like okay i'm all in so right. faked a knee injury didn't play in the combine went to the draft and was so sure i was going to new york and five minutes before the draft starts new york trades the number five pick for the number one pick and a player to be named later right so, 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 so that, uh, how, how did you take that? That's, so that's a pretty big uh, shift. I was shitting my pants. <laughs> yes. Because the number two pick was Salt Lake, I think, then Kansas City, then Columbus, and I desperately didn't want to go to any of those clubs right. at that time. Um, so I was just hoping and waiting that I would fall to number five and, and go to Chivas, and, and it worked out. So I ended up back home, and then the player that got traded was Jason Hernandez, who ended up playing with Chivas, but we had played together at Seton Hall. He was the guy who hosted me on my recruiting trip to Seton Hall. So we lived in Redondo Beach and at the time of our lives for the first couple of years <laughs> in MLS, and it all worked out perfectly, but it was nerve-wracking. Well, and, you, and Bob and, and Chivas Jose had success in this stadium you know, at that time. This was, you know, I, I know... Uh, certainly in LA Galaxy fandom, you know, there's this idea that Chivas USA was never good. That's nope. not the case. Nope. Um, nope. And you guys put together some some really good seasons in, in that. What was what was that like finally to be here at at you know in, in Major League Soccer at a professional level? And I mean, like you said, you, you're probably living your dream at that point. Yeah, I was I I was very excited about coming to Chivas because they had been so bad the year before. Okay, and I thought that that gave me a real good opportunity to be a starter from the get go. Right. Whereas Galaxy won the title in 05. Mm -hmm. And even though I was a Galaxy fan growing up, I thought I'm going to go into the team that's won MLS Cup. I probably won't play. So there were certain teams that had, I was kind of hoping to go to a bad team, right. quote unquote. And so, you know, then Bob had took over. He brought in Jesse Marsh. He brought Ante Razoff. Claudio Suarez was still here. Ramon Ramirez, Paco Palencia. So I got to learn from like such a great group of veteran players right. that it was amazing. And then you know, unfortunately for Ramon Ramirez, who probably would have been the starting center midfielder, he tore his ACL in preseason. Yep. And I started, I think, 31 of the 32 games my rookie year next to Jesse Marsh in the midfield, learned so much from all these guys. And it was kind of just a, a, a perfect storm of events that happened for me to be a starter, to play a ton of games as a young guy, to learn a lot. And then not only that, we had such a good team. Like, right. you know, we made the playoffs all four years. We were one point off the supporter shield, I think my second or third season. So... You know, yeah, Chivas is remembered for being a bad team, but while I was here, we were we were very good, that, very that, competitive. That's not too bad. Well, then you, you you take that success that you had with Chivas, and and certainly you know uh, rising to the top of uh, of a developing league here in Major League Soccer, and you go to Belgium. Um, how did that all sort of come about? And um, were you excited to take that next step? Was there some some nervous anticipation for that? No, you know, I think after probably my second or two and a half years in, I was ready to make the move, and and unfortunately. You know, Chivas and MLS were asking for a pretty hefty uh, transfer fee at that right. time, which was hard for teams in Europe to pay, I think, for a young American who still was kind of unproven. Um, so another kind of interesting story or luck or guy who was watching was there was an agent from Belgium who decided to have one year of just he wanted to move away from Belgium, wanted to live in L.A. Okay. So he came with his family. He moved to L.A. He wasn't an agent anymore. He was just kind of chilling, gave right. himself a year to hang. But he would come to every Galaxy and every Chivas game. And so he watched me for pretty much a whole season, I think, in 08. And, and by the end of it, he called Anderlecht and was like, you guys need to come by this kid. He's, he's good. You right. guys should come watch him. So the, 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 the vice president and the general manager flew out here and watched the playoff game against Salt Lake, I think, in 08. 
And, you know, the next day they took me to the Beverly Hills Hotel and they wooed me and they they told me they wanted to sign me. And I was like, yes, let's go. Let's do it. And, you know, it's a, uh, a big club in a small league. And, and it seemed like the next step for me. And they put in a bid and it got denied. They put in a bid, it got denied. And uh, I was pretty frustrated. It was a tough time. I really wanted to go to Europe. It had always been my dream. I'd been watching Champions League, you know, every day throughout high school. It was my dream to play in Champions League. And so that was kind of a down period in my career because I was so frustrated by not being able to fulfill my dream. I just didn't know, like, would they continue to follow me? What right. would happen? Whatever. And then a, a year and a half later, when I was finally six months away from being finished with my contract, they bought me. And, uh, you know, that, it was awesome. I, I was just looking on Twitter right before we came on here, and I still follow Anderlecht so much. That's the, you know, my, the favorite club I've ever played for, the one that stays closest to my heart. And they, you know, they just showed a picture of a guy at the airport in Brussels who just flew in from South America who's signing for the team. Right. And I'm just like, uh, I, that day that I flew to Belgium was one of the best days of my life. Like, I, making that transfer was huge for me, and I loved it. Well, what's, the, what's the mindset difference um, just between, let's say, European players and, and, and American players? I mean, I know a lot is made of it in the media, and certainly, oh, well, it's different. and you know, everything. I, I imagine it is different. I imagine that there are different levels, but is it that different? It's very different. Okay. Okay, so when a new player comes to our locker room here in the States, we mostly are very, very welcoming. Right. We introduce, like, you know, we put them in the group right away, whatever, let's go out to dinner. We always try to do our best to invite guys right. in right away. Over there, you have to prove yourself before they invite you in. So I remember my first week of training camp in Belgium. We, we had gone over to Holland. You know, we were staying in a little hotel. We were training twice a day. And we had one day where it was just, we were playing small-sided games, 5v5, and I didn't track my runner one time, and the guy scored, and they, they had a go at me, and they yelled at me. Right. And then, like, another minute later, my guy got behind me again and scored, and they were like, who is this American? Like, they were really like, who is this kid? Like, right. And they were getting after me. Right. And I remember I went back to my room, and I was so frustrated and sad and, like, homesick. Uh -huh. And, like, I was like, okay, well, I came here. I came here because I got a big contract. I'm going to make good money. This is good for my life. But like, fuck these guys. Sorry for my language. No, it's fine. You can bleep it out. Yes, I can. And like, uh, but also like, I'm going to prove these guys wrong. They don't know. They don't know anything about American soccer. And right. I'm going to like, whatever. So it took me then about six weeks. And I finally broke into the team. And then I played like every game after that. And then like, once you start playing, you're one of the guys. Oh, oh we're going out to dinner. You yeah. want to come? And like, it, it takes some time. But yes, they're not as welcoming. You have to prove yourself first. Whereas here, I think we're more of a welcoming group. Do you remember one moment that sort of maybe cemented you proving yourself? Or was it just the cumulative effort that you were putting in at that time? There was one moment where I think I proved to myself and the coaches. And that was in a reserve game. Okay. So it had been about six weeks where... You know, I was on the bench, but I wasn't playing. And we had lost a game or two, and then we had a Europa League game on Thursday night against, uh, oh, man, I, against AEK Athens at home. Okay. And the reserve games in Belgium always happen on a Monday. So our team, like, played on Saturday or Sunday, and then the, and the reserve games there are mostly, like, under 20. Okay. So most of the kids, and some of the talented kids are, like, 16, and I'm 23, I think, 24. Right. right. So I'm you're allowed to have two overage players and they're like, all right, come on. We want to see you play. You need some minutes. And then the assistant coach came and grabbed me right before and said, Hey, the head coach is coming tonight to watch you play. Right. Take this game seriously. Cause you guys will probably win like five zero, but just play seriously. And so I was like, okay, I could be pissed off right now and be like, I can't believe I'm playing in this, this game with kids. Right. Or I can just play the game seriously with the best mentality I possibly can have and, and you know, just show the coach how serious I am, whatever. So I played the game. I played normal. I didn't even score or have an assist, but I played a good game. Right. And we won like 6 or 7-0. And on the Thursday, I started in the Europa League game, and then that was that. I kind of started almost every game after that. And it was like, okay, good. Like I showed him my mentality. Right. And he, he, he got that in me right away that I had the mentality to keep pushing and keep going. And, and that was the kind of moment I proved to myself, like I'm here to stay. Right. Um, I don't know the moment like to the rest of the team. It kind of just builds over time. Right. I had this other coach who always said like, I don't need you to play like a 10 out of 10. And I can't have you ever play at like a 5 out of 10. You just have to be the 6 or the 7 out of 10 every game. Just steady, steady, steady. And I think that over time, you earn the respect of your teammates. That, that's one, uh, a lot of times we used to say this about some different coaches, that you know what you're going to get from somebody. And if you can predict that, right? It's, yeah. it's not, it, the highs and the highs, that's great. The lows of the lows, you need to try to get out. But it's that, it's that middle sort of yeah. 
uh, you know, steady every game. We know that you're going to get this performance out of it. Is that is that a mindset for for all players, or or do some players sort of do differently? I mean, I'm asking you to look into other people's minds, but I'm sure you've been around some other some other guys. I think it depends on the position you play. Right. So center back and center midfielder, those are the guys you need to be the steady guys. You know, the the outside backs. I think of a kid like Julian who can get up and down he can bring you so much he can make so many plays defensively and on the attacking side that sometimes you get some games where he's phenomenal and because he's young he sometimes has games where he makes some mistakes right and the attacking side of the game you're allowed to take more chances yes and so you take some chances and sometimes they don't pay off and people say oh you're horrible and you take some chances someday and you score a hat trick and people say you're the best in the world yeah. so those are the type of guys that can have those 10 and those four or five games but you know mostly i think the guys in the middle of the field have to be the steady eddies i, I love it the life of a striker is uh fail 99 times score once good job everybody yes. you know defender yes. i was a uh, i played center back so i was uh, uh very much aware of the uh let one guy behind you for one game for a half split second and everything uh sort of falls away by the way this is the favorite part of my show where i compare my very <laughs> minor amateurish soccer skills to professional athletes is it's one of the favorite things to do i i think that's the beautiful thing about soccer is that it's such an accessible sport that so many people have played it at some point in their lives that they can relate to us on the field um so I, I enjoy that you said that. Okay, okay, good. I'm, I'm glad. I always think most of the guys are like, yeah, sure, buddy. I'm, no, I'm, no. Sure, I'm sure you played. I, um, I'm sure you can recognize the different levels of the game and see that, the you know, oh, obviously that, the skill that takes place yeah, out I, on that That field. was not me. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. 100% was yeah. not me. I can I can see that every single time. Um, okay, so Anderlecht uh, wraps up. You, you come back. Um, I think go to Red Bulls, right? Um, very successful there and back in New York where, where you wanted to be at the, at the beginning of it. So how was that? That was that was just great for like uh, our family and timing. We had just had our first baby. Uh, my daughter was born in Belgium, and then Jesse Marsh had taken over at New York, and and uh, you know he he was the one who really convinced me to come. We had played together for four years. We had remained close, and you know he said, "I'm building this new project in New York. I really want you to be a centerpiece for it." And and. Uh, it didn't take a ton of convincing because at that moment at Anderlecht, a lot of things were changing. A lot of the older players were moving on. A lot of younger players from the academy were coming up. And, um, you know, I have to say like a big thank you to Anderlecht because they let me leave basically for free when I still had a lot of time left in my contract because they knew I wanted to, to go back and, and try this new project in New York. So uh, it all worked out. Things were great in New York. Jesse was a phenomenal coach. The group of guys that we had in that team in New York was awesome. It was a, a really, really fun part of my career. We're, we're going to, uh, you know, there was Orlando as well and then and coming here to, to L.A. And I, I don't want to brush over Orlando, but I do want to sort of, you talked about the guys in the locker room and so often and, and certainly covering this team for, uh, this is my 14th season covering the Galaxy. I've seen the different locker rooms. I've seen the different interactions. And while uh, obviously I'm on the outside looking in, you can tell when guys get along and when guys don't get along. Um, how important is that to the, to the overall success of a club is whether or not, I mean, I would imagine there's some teams where guys hate each other and they're still, abs for whatever reason, they get up and they can win games and they can be very, probably win championships in that way. There seems to be more of a lean, especially here in the United States. It's the group of players that get together and, you know, sort of are almost like a family and that, that seem to have the most success. I mean, what, what are your thoughts on all that? From my experience uh, in the States, the teams that get along the most and have the most camaraderie and family type feel and really enjoy being around each other are the teams that have the most success. So I would say my first year I got here to the Galaxy in 2020, that was not the case at all. Right. And, and everybody could recognize that. I think I've, I've spoken to Galaxy fans at like the season ticket events and stuff and they were like, you know, we could tell the locker room was broken and like we could see it from the outside. And it's amazing how you can start to see these things. They right. start to creak out, creep out. Now I think it's so much better. Um, here we've got a great group of guys, guys that enjoy being around each other, that have a good time together, that hang out when we're in the hotels or when we're on the road. And, and that just means a lot to the group. And that just makes coming to work so much more fun. Right. In Orlando, it was the opposite also. It was just that it, we weren't a great group. We were not a good group of guys to, that, that were around. You didn't want to come to work. You didn't want to spend extra time at work. And you saw it on the field. We had two losing seasons. In New York, again, it was the same. We were such a good group. And we had winning seasons. Right. So uh, I think that part is just so important to build that in the locker room. It's funny because I always try to say, and, and obviously looking at, let's say, you know, basically since 2017 and onward, there's there's been a, a lull for the LA Galaxy and, and trying to get up and build that. And so you're always trying to go back. And I've had 
the I've been fortunate to talk to a whole bunch of guys who have played on a lot of the championship teams and sort of that. And I ask, you know, what was the difference? You talked about wanting to come to work, right? And I think that's such a big thing because I think that's something everybody can relate to, right? It's like, well, if you want to go to your job every day, then that sounds like that's a, you'll probably do a better job if you want to go to your job every day. If you have a boss who sits there and screams and yells at you all the time, you're probably not going to be in the best situation where you're going to be successful. And I don't know. For me, that's really simple, right? I can put that together in my mind and do it. I think fans have a harder time because you're professional athletes and you guys get paid to play soccer and it shouldn't matter what your feelings are. You should go out and play. But that's, that's so not the case. No, it's not the case. It's, in fact, the opposite. It's the same. We are all human beings, just like all the fans. This is our job, even though I, I don't think of it as a job because I, I think of it as my life and what I love to do. And I think most guys do. But in the end, this is what we're paid to do. And we're paid to show up at a certain time and do certain things. Right. And so I guess technically that is a job. And so when you come to work and you enjoy being with the guys and you're willing to stay an extra hour after training just to, you know, whatever it is, watch video or work on technique or even if we just play two-touch juggling in the locker room for, yeah. for flicks on the ears and things like that, it brings the group together, it makes it more fun, and, and then you enjoy being here and that's when you continue to get better. Yeah, you, you, can, you can sort of see that. Uh, talk about this LA Galaxy team. Um, We've seen shimmers of this team. Last year, uh, started off hot. I would say probably won some games maybe you shouldn't have won. It, it's this weird sort of thing. We can always look at stats and sort of go back and look. But bottom line is you guys won games to, to begin the season. There was the last third of the season that was an utter disaster. And, you know, you guys couldn't win a game to save your lives. And mm -hmm. it was just trying to build and, and do that. And, you know, I think if some things go just a little bit differently, obviously you guys tie on points basically and lose in the last seconds uh, with, with RSL, which cheated, by the way. I am, I am the, this big believer that the RSL cheated uh, you guys out of that spot. <coughs> I will say it. You don't have to. Um, but we're seeing a different team, even though the starts are very similar in a lot of ways. Um, do you feel like it's different? Yes, I feel like it's different. I think I'm a big believer that at the end of the season, the table is the table and your points are your points, and that's exactly where you deserve to be. Right. And so we weren't good enough last year. That's the bottom line. This year, I think we are a better team. We are more connected. We are much more difficult to score against, mm -hmm. and that's the starting point for a playoff team. Um, and then, you know, if you're into data and science and underlying numbers and all that, the amount of chances we give up from the run of play is some of the best in the league. Yes, it is. And so that is very, very important. Can we clean up things on set pieces? We, we must. Yes. We have to if we want to be a you know, top third team in the league, playoff team, challenge for trophies. Uh, and we also need to pick up the slack in scoring away from Chicharito because he can, we cannot just depend on him to score goals like last season. He was the only one who had a lot of goals, and nobody, none of our attackers picked up the slack. And his, so. and his injuries probably ultimately led, because he wasn't on the field, led to you guys missing the playoffs. Yeah, and so you can never be dependent on one guy. We right. need more guys to step up. So that's where we're at right now. Uh, I am a big believer in our team. I think we're very good. I think in the last few weeks we saw a big step from Kevin Cabral yeah. and Sam Grancier, mm -hmm. who if they can continue to push and push and develop and contribute more goals and assists, then we are really a force to be reckoned with in the league. You're the unofficial translator on this team too as well, aren't you? So, so you're one of the few guys who can speak French outside of the guys who, who came over, right? Yes, I do a lot of translating. <laughs> I, they all sit around me too, so the my area of the locker room is heavily French. That, that's fun. That's good. Yeah. I, I want to approach one thing. Um, obviously, MLSPA puts out the salary numbers uh, every single year, um, and um, one of the things our podcast does, we track all that stuff when we pay attention. You took a significant pay cut according to those numbers to stay here in L.A. Um, one is why. Um, and two is, um, are you part of any mentoring program that I know MLS has where you can go and, and, and help academy kids and, and do some other things and under sort of this, this program that they have? Yeah, I, I took a big pay cut because I wanted to be here. Uh, I'm at the point in my life where I didn't feel like packing up and moving to chase a paycheck. I feel like I've never played the, the game for money. Um, of course, I've done very well for myself. I'm very fortunate. I've made good money in my career. So I'm able to do this now at this point in my life to 
keep playing, obviously not for a big paycheck, but to continue to do what I love. Um, I wanted to be part of the team. Greg still wanted me to be part of the team. And so that, that was, you know, kind of what was available and what worked out. Right. It's not always fun to take a huge paycheck. I, I was going to say, I mean, <laughs> there's, it, it, at least according to the numbers, and I, don't, yeah. I, I always say these are, we've heard they're fairly accurate. Don't know if they're 100% accurate, but it's significant. It's $130,000, something less than you were making last year. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's no fun. It takes, um, it took some time this off season to digest it yeah, and be okay with it. Right. And then try to put it behind me Uh so that I could move forward in a positive way and not be thinking like, Oh man, that guy makes half a million more than me and this (laughs) is what I, it is what it is. Once I sign the contract, I sign the contract. That's my salary. That's what I agreed to. I can't complain about it anymore. So that, but it took some time this off season to sit down with my wife and, you know, is this what I really want to do? Is this what I want to continue? And she's like, of course you do. (laughs) And this was the option that was presented. So we agreed upon it and move on. And I'm just happy to still be playing for this club. I enjoy playing soccer every day. I enjoy being around the guys in the locker room. I love being part of the LA galaxy. So it is what it is. And and on the mentor programs, are you part of that, that system where you're able to, I, I guess I always say it's a mentor program. It's like a, a coaching position where you're able to learn and also get compensated for some of that and yeah. then also go ahead and, and help out the academy teams and I think G2 teams, that type of thing. Yeah, yeah. So I'm available to help out at the discretion of the coaching staff uh, through any part of the club, which uh, was really good last year because of uh, I did my B license for coaching last right. year. So I helped a lot with the under 13, under 14 team that was coached by Juninho. So that was a big experience for me that I, I learned a lot. I mean, I think I helped the kids a lot too, right. but I took a lot out of it myself. So that's that part's been good also that the club has helped me in that way. You, you, you talking about coaching, is that the next step for you? I hate this because every time we talk with you, it's always like, hey, you're the veteran on the team, which is code word for old, right? Um, and so you know, we're always asking these questions, but you're aware that the time is coming that it's, it's, that soccer, the playing part is not available to you. And is coaching sort of that next step for you? Um, I'm, I'm at this crossroads right now where I am not fully in on anything yet. Right. It's tough to, it's tough to decide. I, I have done coaching. I'm very interested in coaching. I, I do a lot of coaching and training every day. I, I feel like a natural coach. Um, having said that, I've also had some uh, opportunities presented to me from the media to do some type of analyst roles in right. the studios. Recently, I did it with Fox for the UEFA Nations League. So I, I would say I'm not fully committed on either one of those things yet, and the future you, remains to be seen. We're also offering you a, the, the <laughs> podcasting position, the Sasha Kleshin Show on Corner of the Galaxy. Whenever you want to do that, just let me know. Um, hey, we'll, we'll get, it's, the, the paycheck is horrible. Um, <laughs> I'm just gonna I'm gonna let you know. But um, so. I mean, we see all these things. We see everything sort of wrapping up. I mean, what is your prognostication for this team? How good can this team be? Because I think we saw a different level in that Open Cup game against LAFC. That, and Greg said it was you know, the best game that they played in the last maybe two years. He's only been here for two years, so it may be longer than that. <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. Um, it has been a long time since the Galaxy have really played a game that good. And then sort of to back that up with maybe not as complete a performance, but with a dominant second half performance against against a team like Austin, two teams that like to play. Yeah. Um, how do you see this team developing through these uh, next, uh, it's almost half the season, but the, yeah. the second half. Like I said, I'm very optimistic about our group. I think we have a very good team. Uh, clean up the things that I talked about earlier, but I do believe that we have championship quality team. Um, the challenge may be for us to to play and dominate like we did against LAFC and Austin the way we can do that against a team that maybe sits back more Yeah, where the game is not as open mm-hmm. um, LAFC likes to play they like to play fast you know then they then they you know leave some spaces open at the back where, where we were able to exploit them Austin also a very ball playing team very possession based oriented team who wants to have the ball and then spreads themselves out and we were able to hit them on a few moves also uh so we'll see how you know this portland game will probably look a lot different portland is a team that's very comfortable without the ball yes so that i think will be the challenge which is 
always kind of the challenge in MLS. When I played in New York also, we always struggled to break teams down that just sat back and let us have the ball. That's tough. It's tough to break down a team that puts 10 guys behind the ball. So that will be the big challenge for us. But uh, I really love the mentality that we've shown in the Open Cup games because those are playoff type games. Right. And now we've set ourselves up with a home game against Sacramento that hopefully we can win and, and move on to the semifinals, which... You know, Galaxy, I don't know when the last time, I'm sure you know when they got I, to the semifinals. I don't know, no, because yeah. I mean, we talk about the wins, um, you know, in the Open Cup, but actually getting to the semifinals, it's been a long time. It's I mean, long. Bruce didn't really like the yeah. Open Cup that yeah. much, so yeah. uh, Bruce was sort of like, eh, whatever, it doesn't really matter, which, you know, in his defense, he won a lot of MLS Cups, so I guess you can do that whenever you, you yeah, do that. Yeah, yeah. I, I personally love the Open Cup. Mm -hmm. I've never won it. I really want to win it. I lost in the final in, in 17, I think. Um, and then went to the semifinals with Orlando. And so I've been close recently, and I, I would love to lift that trophy in the end. I, I think it's a fantastic competition with a ton of history. And, you know, uh, I've also been able to start a few of these Open Cup games right. this season. So that's been fun. I got to walk my son out on the field with me for the first time. That was fun. That was fun. So, yeah, yeah, we saw that. Yeah. that. That looked like it was a lot of fun. Yeah. My, my contention with this LA Galaxy team is sometimes I think you guys are a counterattacking team that, that masquerades as a possession based team because do a great job holding possession and a lot of times you know you look at the possession numbers after a game and they can be very lopsided in, in, in terms of that but really the best games that you have played that this team has played um come sort of in that more counter-attacking and exploiting space behind is is that a fair assessment it may be a fair assessment from the outside i think from the inside we want to be a possession-based team to control the game right but we also have to be better at exploiting the spaces when they're there. And so, you know, like we said, against LAFC and Austin, it's easier to do that against a team like that who gives you that space right. or who opens themselves up and leaves that space. Um, I think we've, we've kind of tried to tilt the things a little bit more now to be a little bit more aggressive, whereas in the past we've taken the direction from the coaching staff to be very possession-based, but but with an idea that you have to finish attacks. You can't just keep the ball all day. Like Keeping yeah. the ball all day doesn't win you games. Right. And so now in the last few games, we've finished more attacks, and that has been, that has been really good for us, that you know, putting more balls in the box, putting more pressure on the defense, that right. has opened up the game more for us, and we've been able to finish more goals in the last few games than we did in the previous probably five combined. Let's, uh, we'll, we'll wrap this up sort of on this last topic. Um, Certainly, talking with players over over the you know the amount of time that I have, um, we get certain guys who are comfortable speaking to the media. Some guys who aren't comfortable speaking to the media. Uh, some guys who are very happy to stay quietly in their lane, uh, aren't aren't active on social media, don't want to get any uh, feathers ruffled. Those guys, 100% understand that and 100% to get it. You're not that guy. Um, you seem to be socially active in a, in, in a lot of ways. I mean, I, how how do you feel? How do you personally feel comfortable? doing that because there's so many players who would be like I don't want to stick my neck out there for for any sort of social cause that sort of comes up well I think it's just mostly because of my age and where I'm at in my life I think when I was younger I probably wouldn't have spoken out so much now I have kids who uh, I think it's my responsibility to show them what it's like to be a leader show them what it's like to stand up for something that you believe in and yeah I would say it's mostly because of my kids I want them to see responsibility i want them to see uh yeah what it means to if you believe in something that you take a stance on it and you're not afraid to say it right. and so um i'm happy to be the guy that speaks after every loss because nobody else wants to talk <laughs> oh it, wow it, so you figured out our is, system already right? it is what it is <laughs> some guys don't want to talk after a loss and you know someone's got to do it so you know i've when I was younger, I was annoyed by having to do these things. And as I've got older, I've recognized the importance of what the media does for us and how they help tell our stories. And, um, you know, just like this isn't even your first job. This is not, I, this is technically not a job for me. Exactly. So, so, this so, is, so I took off a little bit of time from work yes. to come up here and talk to you. But and, that's, and so I've learned most of the soccer writers are like that. Yeah. And so we're not the NBA. We're not the NFL yet. So... Uh, I, I, I try at the end of every season to thank you guys for covering our team, for covering our league, because without it, then we wouldn't be as popular as we are. And so, 
in the end, someone's got to talk to the media, and I'm happy to do it because I respect and appreciate what you guys have done. Well, it, it's it's likewise, and uh, always a pleasure. So we'll we'll let it go with that. Um, obviously, uh, good luck with recovery. Hope everything uh, goes well for you. We'll see you back out on the field here pretty soon. But yeah, uh, hopefully, I'm available to smash those Smurfs in a few weeks. <laughs> that's right. That's right. I like it up at Stanford, which is one of my most hated stadiums. I hate that. I've stadium, never so. uh, I've never been in that stadium, so I'm looking forward to it. It is horrible. You'll okay. love it. <laughs> okay. um, absolutely. All right. Well, uh, once again, want to thank. Uh, Sasha Kleshin for stopping by today and uh, we have a lot more coverage here on cornerofthegalaxy.com so please go on over subscribe do all those fun things do all those fun things for us uh, go to the website cornerofthegalaxy.com uh, we have shirts available for sale right now as well so check those out we certainly appreciate it big shout out to the LA Galaxy and Sasha Kleshin for stopping by so uh, from Dignity Health Sports Park I'm Josh Gessman you've been listening to Corner of the Galaxy on cornerofthegalaxy.com have a great one everybody You've been listening to the Corner of the Galaxy podcast on cornerofthegalaxy.com. You can follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at Galaxy Podcast. And be sure to check out and subscribe to iTunes, Stitcher, and Facebook by searching for Corner of the Galaxy. Fans, we thank you for listening. We ask that you be kind and courteous to your neighbors as you leave the podcast. We thank you for joining us and look forward to seeing you again. Until then, I'm Michael Araujo. And on behalf of the entire Corner of the Galaxy crew, goodbye, everybody.